Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We are super excited to be hosting our third now employer roundtable. And we've got some absolutely great, wonderful employers. We've got great opportunities. We are so excited to share with you all. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Shami Carr. I'm an advocate at the Disability Rights Center. I do a lot of employment activities. So this is one of my babies I love to do with these employers. One thing I also wanna mention is that we have several partners who uh, work in conjunction with the employers. And I wanna give them a shout out. We work with Vocational Rehab, Small Business Development Center, yeah, you said both out of University of the Virgin Islands, SBDC and the Virgin Islands University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. We also work with VI Economic Development Authority. Uh, we work with Island Therapy Solutions and we work with Department of Labor. So this is a group we've had for almost two years. And on a quarterly basis, we also do trainings with the federal EEOC. Be looking out for that. Any businesses that may be on and the businesses that are with us, we'll be doing our quarterly training with the EOC next uh, week on ADA, reasonable accommodation, and long COVID. So getting back to today, I hope we've got a lot of job seekers on who are ready to hear some great information. Now, just some housekeeping before we start. One is that you can save your questions, please, to the end. If you want to put them in the chat so you don't forget, no problem at all. Uh, we want the uh, employers to be able to go through their whole presentation with no interruption, but we will leave time at the end to answer any questions that we can. Please do not ask any questions that are personal in nature. Uh, you can contact the, uh, the recruiters directly or I can help facilitate that for you. If you've got general questions, feel free to wait to the end. Secondly, if you're a job seeker and you are truly looking for a job, these people are here to recruit. This is in a, re a recruitment event. So please have pen and paper ready, write down information they give you. If you don't follow their specific instructions on how to apply, that lets them know that, you're, first of all, you're not listening or you're not following directions. Therefore, you would not make a good employee. Okay, so please be astute about the information they give, the process they give, how to reach them. If they say email me and you call them again, you're not listening and make sure you have pen and paper because at the end, everybody will give you their contact information to be able to follow up. Okay, so with that, uh, just so you know, this is being recorded. We will have this on our YouTube channel. So people who could not attend, or if you have other people who would like to watch this, feel free to have them jump on YouTube when this gets posted. With that, we're going to get started with all of our employers and we are so blessed to have four of them. Um, so I'm gonna start with uh, WAPA. The, each one is going to introduce themselves, their name, their position and the organization that they work for. And then we'll start the actual presentation. So Tracy, would you like to start please? Sure, good morning, everyone. My name is Tracy Wells. I am the manager of learning and development at the Virgin Islands Water and Power Authority, and I work in the human resources office. Wonderful, thank you, Tracy. And Jennifer, would you like to go next, please? Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Matarangas King. I am the vice president of public relations and governmental affairs for VIA. Good you. morning. Good morning. And Marie? Hi, my name is Marie Burton, and I'm the HR manager at PSMT LLC, actually DBA, which is doing business as Price Smart. Most people know it as Price Smart. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. But, Thank you. And Doug? Thank you so much for having us. My name is Doug. I'm the CEO of M1 Enterprises. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. As you can see, these are well-known employers and I know Doug is new to the field but I can tell you one thing he's got an amazing alternative to, to different types of employment so we're just lucky to have such great employers with us. So let's start the presentation. I'm going to be asking four questions of each employer and again pay attention to their responses. This presentation is meant for you as a job seeker to feel empowered and to feel like I see a good match with one of these employers or maybe you see more than one. So keep that in mind as we go through this presentation. Okay, so I think we'll do the same order again. We'll start with Tracy. What is the culture of your organization and maybe a little bit of history? So because of the nature of our business, um, of course, we are the, uh, I guess, most important <laughs> utility in the, in the, in the uh, territory. Um, you know, we, we take our work serious, of course. We have a lot of uh, safety, sensitive positions, hazardous positions, and we're really focused on making sure that 
we're an organization that promotes um, learning and um, employee development. We, we like to keep things in a way where it's, it's more of a family type environment, but it's definitely a culture where we support our employees. Um, of course, we, you know, we act in the best interest of our employees and it's someplace where we believe in just nurturing um, the individuals who perform other daily ro roles on, on tasks on behalf of WAPA. Um, and I, I truly believe it's someplace where anyone would feel grateful or even just um, happy you know, to call an employer. That's wonderful. And, and I should have added also with the history and culture, it's the fit. And that's mm -hmm. what you got into with the fit. You know, you have mm -hmm. to be very conscious and safety, you know, um, aware and things like that. So the fit in terms of right. some of those. So great. Thank you, Tracy. And Jennifer with VIA, what's, what's the culture and a good fit for your company? Okay, so good morning, everyone, again. So let me just give you just a quick overview. I think most people know what we do, but I, I would like to, to be clear. Uh, and I do want to say that although we have been around as a company for more than 60 years, we are not the company that we were prior to Hurricanes Irma and Maria. We're not even the same company that we were before COVID. We've changed a lot. So we're a telecom provider, and uh, we have moved from just providing products and services to really being a solutions provider, particularly for the business sector. We provide services in terms of um, most of you who are listening probably have at least one of our services in your home or business. So of course we have landline, we have our mobile service and that includes everything from our uh, phones, but also our MiFi's, which are extremely popular. Uh, we have uh, entertainment in terms of cable TV and our TV Plus product. Um, and of course, on the business solutions side, business solutions as a name has been around for, for many years, but we really have fully developed that team. Um, most recently, we did a tech talk presentation for businesses and government, and especially in that sector, letting everyone know that we are a telecom solution provider. Uh, as you're building your business, we're there for you to help you, not just sell you a product, but really help to take you to the next level. So we really have evolved quite a bit. Um, because we are a telecom company, technology is a very dynamic place, ever-changing. Uh, you know, no two years are the same. We're constantly looking at what's next, you know, newer devices, newer products and services. And I can tell you, um, having gone through uh, the pandemic with the entire world, uh, we shifted quite a bit in terms of the way that we do business. Back in the day, we would encourage you to come to us, come to us to get services, and our approach has shifted uh, drastically um, on the consumer and the business side where we are in the communities. Community engagement is, is very, very important for us. Uh, so whether it's community sales or dealers, our engagement is more um, going out into the community to ensure that we can provide the products and services. In terms of our mission, um, our CEO always says at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what your title is at the company, we're all in the business, two things, customer service and sales. And she actually really means that we're all in the business of customer service and sales. And our mission statement, we have, and we're very serious, not only do we have a mission for the company, but each department has its own mission. And so we're all very clear every single day when we come in, why are we here? And I just want to read to you so you get a sense of our perspective and how we see our relationship to our customer. Our company's mission is to deliver our customer promise in order to become the most valued connectivity solutions provider in the VI. So I didn't talk about any one product or service. I didn't talk about selling any one thing. It's really for you to see us as a solutions uh, provider. Um, our history, we've been here for over 60 years under various names. VIA is the most recent iteration uh, and that uh, occurred in 2017 when Innovative and Choice merged. Um, prior to that, we were known as Innovative and Vitelco. So we have been in the community uh, for decades, but I, I do want to reiterate that because of a series of things, um, we were always moving forward, but I think the hurricanes actually uh, caused us to accelerate certain projects, particularly on the mobile side. And COVID really, I think, um, really embedded us even more in the community because I think mm -hmm. everyone knows now that connectivity is not optional. You know, connectivity is critical for everything that you do. And especially if you're a job seeker, you need connectivity to get and keep a job. So, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along. And then of course, um, good fit. Uh, VIA is a very dynamic place. Um, like I said, no two days are the same. It's a, I encourage anyone who's interested in coming in, you may be applying for a specific role, 
But I strongly encourage you to think about VIA as a place that you can really learn and grow. Um, adaptability is important. Your job description is simply a guide, but it's great to learn about the company and the interconnectivity. And I'll briefly use myself as an example. I've been with the company for 24 years and I have had uh, various roles at the end of the day. This is where I am now as a VP of public relations and governmental affairs, but I was a manager of corporate planning. I was the director of the business offices uh, for several years. I was in charge of cable TV, USVI and BVI for five years. And I have been in this role for the last 13 years. So you have an opportunity to come in. Um, obviously, I came in with certain credentials, uh, education and background, but I learned a lot about the business. And I think it's a great place that when you come in, you really can learn a lot about telecom, which is, a, you know, in terms of innovation, cutting edge, uh, it's a great place to be. So that's fire. 100%, 100%. We're definitely going to talk about career ladders and promotions uh, further down. So I'm glad you started that conversation. So thank you. Okay, Marie, in terms of, again, the culture and the fit of your organizational history. Pricemont is, is a membership-based club. Um, they're located in 50 countries. And it's a, it actually started in the US, but we now have clubs in various countries in the Caribbean and Central America. It's, um, there's always room for upward movement because it's not only the front end jobs that are available like cash, et cetera. We also have sales audit, payroll, um, facility. And our mission is to provide our members an outstanding shopping experience with high quality existing, exciting merchandise and service at the lowest possible prices. As I said, that there's always room for upward movement. I, I work many different areas. I started in 2009 and I um, started as a, a temp outside of, I wasn't even employed by PriceMath and within a few months they hired me and I'm now the HR manager. And that's interesting you brought up temp because uh, just so you know, there is a temp agency, a large one called Select Temp out of St. Croix, but they do job orders throughout the whole territory. So just a little plug for them since you mentioned temp. And um, again, this is great to hopefully the audience is seeing these are real life examples of people actually getting promoted. You know, it's just not walking the walk, they're talking it, they're doing it and they're showing you literally. So great, thank you, Marie. And Doug, again, fit culture, a little history about your organization. Okay, <clears throat> again, thank you for having us. Um, our, our fit here is we have 30 years of healthcare experience and we also have a job training program. We merge the two together to create M1 enterprises. And here we're now introducing that as, 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 the, as the pathway for people to start and, and have jobs learning, living and working in the US Virgin Islands. You no longer have to leave the Virgin Islands for a good job. No longer can anyone say there's no jobs in the Virgin Islands. And COVID accelerated the acceptance of remote workforce. So now the jobs are here. And with technology, like with VIA, there's, it's leveled the playing field. So someone in the Virgin Islands is just as valuable as anywhere else in the country. So we're excited about bringing healthcare and technology opportunities to everyone in the Virgin Islands. And we're, we're focused on remote workforce and, like I said, healthcare and technology jobs that are in demand. And we have a lot of experience with that. So we're bringing those years of experience. I'm the old guy now. And rather than retiring, we're trying to share our, our roadmap and our story for people so that they could work remotely because it changes a lifestyle, how they raise their families. And it, it's exciting for me. I get very passionate about that. And uh, the opportunities, oh my goodness, talk to us, reach out to me. I'll share the opportunities that are really there today. Uh, as an example, there's like 20,000 jobs today in healthcare as certified coders and builders. And you can learn, live and work right here doing that. And you can work on the network uh, with VIA, uh, you can have, you know, with WAPA, all of us working together can, can create and, and change the economy here and change lifestyles in the Virgin Islands. And uh, there's opportunities for everyone here. I had met Doug and just like I met Jennifer back in late January at Tutu, there was a a department of education was doing an adult education outreach and I had met both of them and immediately invited um, them because via, of course, we know via, and I have to give a shout out to via because your customer service is exceptional. I've had terrible customer service in the States. 
you guys are exceptional. I have to, you know, I've had it myself. And for Doug to have such a great opportunity for remote was a good mix in terms of traditional work, mm -hmm. remote work. And for people that we serve, people with disabilities, sometimes remote work is a great option. So I just love when Doug says, work, play, stay in the Virgin Islands, but you can work and don't have to leave island. I think that's all the intent of the employers here is to keep the talent in the Virgin Islands and to show them they can definitely have a career right here. Okay, wonderful. Now, the next question I'm gonna ask, and again, hopefully the audience is paying close attention because this is where you can decide if, if you're qualified, not qualified. And also let me back up to mention, Doug mentioned about a training um, and he mentioned high demand. If you're with labor or if you're not, you should get with labor because Doug is actually approved vendor, training vendor for them, which means that you will not be paying for that training or, or in terms of the resources that's available to you through DOL. And if anybody is on DOL on the um, uh, event today, feel free to raise your hand and we'll give you a few minutes to talk about that. All the jobs that people are mentioning right now are high demand, customer service, um, you know, logistics, um, obviously anything with IT, remote. So these employers are considered high demand. And if you're a person with a disability and you're going through labor, it's a good chance you can get any of these types of training paid if they require it. And if you are working with vocational rehab, they should also have resources to be able to help you support working with these employers because they are all high demand. Okay, so I just wanna make sure you guys know that as we go to the screening process. So the screening process, I'm gonna break up in two parts. First part I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna rotate the other way. I'm gonna ask Doug first about your education level, any license certifications that's required for entry level with you. Right, in, in healthcare, first off, uh, a lot of people will get into healthcare and they'll do billing, they'll do coding, some of the facilities will bring them in. And if you don't know the proper way to code things, if you don't know the proper, you know, how to, how to be compliant with everything, what happens is the healthcare facilities provide this level of service, but the billing and the reimbursements are at this level, which means they actually lose money. And when they lose money over time, you see a degradation in healthcare services. And so it's important that people understand the right coding, and billing procedures. And that's what we bring to the table. We were trained you so you know how to do that properly. Um, that's the reason it's in such high demand right now, people that are certified. Uh, and actually there, we have two different certifications that you can get two different national certification bodies and different programs. But with those certifications, when you apply to a hospital and there's 6,000 hospitals that you can reach out to, not just the hospitals in the USBI, but in the mainland, there's 6,000 hospitals. So what we're preparing people for is, yes, to provide services here, but beyond that, there's, and you don't have to move. You can live here. Like I said, learn, live, and work in the USBI. But if you have those certifications, you're now eligible for those jobs that are in demand. Mm -hmm. And Doug, um, in terms of education level, what's the minimum that you need as for education level? A high school diploma. So high school diploma equivalency. And one of the things that Doug was talking about, we we actually have a separate, um, if anybody would like a, a video of, Doug actually just did a, a special session for us because he's new to the territory and he gets much more deep into the, what he calls stackable um, certifications. But it sounds like you can literally go from starting in the thirties. And if you're ambitious to maybe in a year or so, get up to like 60 or $50,000. So this is a great opportunity of growth and also in terms of remote working. So thank you, Doug. Okay, Marie, in terms of screening process, uh, if you could speak to, again, entry level with education, license, or any certifications. Well, the entry level basically starts with a high school diploma, but it all depends on what position you apply for. It can get higher. They might require a, um, a university degree. Um, we also do, we would do a background check for sure. Uh, we do the drug testing and it depends on what position you apply for then the other tests that we have to do. Okay, so, so like many large organizations, I'm sure Vian Wapa will speak to this as well about, you know, there's several entry points into your, your business. And so, so there, it's going to be varied. So at the yes. very least, it sounds like a high school diploma and then some depending on the position. Okay. Yes. Okay, um, all right, uh, Jennifer? You next in terms of the screening process, just with education, license, and certifications. 
Okay, so with education, um, with many of the entry level positions, it's a high school diploma. We have a union environment, so we have union and non-union positions. Uh, so high school diploma or GED for sure, but just like by smart, depending on other types of entry level positions, it may require a degree. Um, one of the things that uh, we are really focusing more on to, it's not mandatory, but it's helpful if you are coming into the organization, applying for a position, and you already have technical certification. Uh, our, our, all of our technical team now, uh, they've just gone through it recently, uh, SCTE training. So there's some industry uh, certification. Those kinds of things are very helpful. And then once again, it depends on the type of job. You know, there's lots of different types of certification in terms of pole climbing and, you know, a whole host of them. And it is very, very helpful if you are applying for a position and you already have those certifications that you acquired in a, a previous job. But generally it's high school diploma, but if it's another type of position, it may be uh, some, some type of a degree. Gotcha, gotcha. And Jennifer, in terms of some of the certifications you're talking about, are those in-house um, trainings that you provide if, if someone doesn't yeah. come with that? Yes, we do. Yes, absolutely. So we, we do provide it. But it's all I mean, that's always an extra advantage. If you already have that, um, mm -hmm. that's wonderful, because then that speaks, you know, certification is a standard that we know, at least, you know, at, at that level, you're able, you're capable of, of doing the job and properly trained. But we do provide in house uh, training and certification. Mm -hmm. And let me just ask this real quick. Uh, do you guys do OJTs at all on the job training? Absolutely. Of labor? Okay. So that's something at the end we can talk about. You just made me think of that when you when we talk about trainings, but I'll remember. I'll, we'll loop back to that afterwards. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Jennifer. So, um, Tracy, in terms of your screening process, education license and or certifications. So the minimum education credential. It really depends on the job that you're applying for. Some positions you have to at least have a high school diploma or a GED. And then similar to what Jennifer mentioned, you have to have a degree for, um, let's say a more technical job or a position that is really um, on um, a more advanced or technical level. So, so it varies depending on, on what you're looking for. Um, our screening process does include a background check um, that looks at your criminal history and your educational credential, your work history. And we also have a drug screening um, tests that we do as part of our pre-employment process. And for safety sensitive positions, we also do physical exams. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, okay, you answered both, the, both of the questions in one question. So we may not have to go back to you for the other screening, but it sounds like um, in terms of a high school diploma minimally or GED, and then depending on the position, and then we can revisit the other stuff with the part two of the, the drug test and fitness for duty. All right, wonderful. So again, if you're listening as a job seeker and you hear them talking about certain credentials, let's say you don't have a high school diploma, it may be worthy to do that. You can see in like Doug's situation, you could, you could do very well. You can make more money than some of the bachelor's degree with a high school diploma, potentially. Mm -hmm. So that's why, again, we ask the questions about education so you know where the starting point is. And if, it, or maybe you already have some college and you realize, oh, I could be actually not overqualified, but I could be more, more ready than I thought I was, okay? So please keep that in mind as you're listening to these employers about how they're describing their screening process. Now we're gonna loop back to part two and I'll just have Tracy kind of reiterate um, the second part of the screening process, which has to do with fitness for duty, drug testing and background check. And um, if you could just run those through real quick again. Okay, um, once you applied for a position and um, you're selected for an interview and uh, you're actually selected for the position or you're now a, a candidate being considered for a position, we put you through a pre-employment process, which again includes a background check, um, a drug test, and a physical exam only if you are applying for a safety sensitive job. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And you said something that was very important too, was the, the, the credential of your education, that check. Some people yes. will put false information about mm -hmm. work or education. I wouldn't mm -hmm. do that because as you can see, some employers will check that, not all do, but some do. And if, if anything is false, that's an automatic disqualification for that job, regardless of how qualified you are, you lied on your application, okay? Right. All right, thank you, thank you, Tracy. Jennifer, yeah. in terms of fitness for duty, drug test background or anything else that's part of your screening process? 
So absolutely, and and like Tracy, uh, you know, the nature of the job. I mean, WAPA has the most sensitive ones, but we have to be extremely careful too, because in many cases we are working uh, along with WAPA on initiatives. So definitely, uh, drug screening is critical. We do a national background check, and then we also do a local background background check on all three islands. Mm -hmm. So um, it's it's very important because the nature of the job it requires people going into not just interacting with customers on the outside, but going into people's homes. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very important uh, for um, everyone's safety that we are pretty thorough with our background checks. Mm -hmm. And and in terms of people going in the home, are they are they um, bonded? Yes. Okay. All right. That's good. Right. So it, okay. before we even before you even get to that, and essentially people that go into the homes are technical positions. Before you get to that point, we do have a hierarchy, so it's a union environment. And entry-level positions, um, there is a process in terms of moving up through the ranks who suit us seniority, and there's some other factors. But um, before you get to the point where you, now and are, there's ex a massive amount of training that's done before you even get to that point. And obviously, before you get to any of that, is the background check because that is where, uh, if there are any issues, you know, we, we deal with that before you're even employed. Mm -hmm. and, and let me give a, a, some advice for people listening who may have a background uh, situation. First, make sure that you check your rap sheet. Sometimes there's mistakes. Sometimes people think that it was expunged, maybe because of right. age or whatever it may be. So if you have any kind of background, double check it before you apply. That way there are no surprises. And again, it will look like you falsified your application if it's not congruent or aligned with what the background check has with your application, okay? Just a piece of advice. Okay, Marie, in terms of your, and I know you spoke a little bit about it, but in terms of fitness for duty, drug tests, background checks, and any other screening process that PriceMart does? Well, the only um, one we do physical, we do a physical for the forklift drivers because you have to be certified. We actually do in-house certification and we send you for physical because you're driving equipment, you can mm -hmm. cause, you know, you have to make sure that you're fit for the job. Mm -hmm. um, and that's about it that needs physical background, physical for the job, just the forklift drivers. And what about any background checks, any criminal background? Yeah, we do do the background checks. We do okay. background checks. Um, we also um, um, do references. We get to your past jobs. We need a past job history. So see if you really, you know, you, sometimes people would lie on the applications and say, mm -hmm. oh, they left the job. But when you started interviewing them, you realize they were actually terminated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, and maybe one of you can speak to it, is when uh, a person puts their references and you as an employer call the references, only X amount of questions they can act, ask. Is that correct? Yes, there are certain questions you cannot ask and certain questions you can ask. Right, right. Does anybody have those questions by chance? I think it'd be very interesting for the audience to know exactly what questions they can ask. I don't know if anybody does that screening. I don't have it right now, but I have a list of questions. Okay. Because usually what I've heard is just your name, your title. Again, they're verifying that you actually work there. Your name, your title, and I think the duration. I don't yeah. think they can ask anything beyond, but again, please correct me if you find out otherwise. This is important for some people, and in some people with disabilities, there's, there may be gaps in your resume. And so it might not, you might look funny or not very good if, you know, the references are kind of sp um, sporadic and so forth. So for people with barriers, these references are incredibly important. So you wanna make sure that the ones that you do put out are very strong, but when they go to verify your employment, that's different. They're just checking to see those things, okay? So it gets a little bit complicated with verification versus references. But Marie, since you brought that up, I thought it'd be a good time to just let people know, job seekers, that there is a difference between the two, okay? And if anybody has questions, feel free to ask at the end about that. And let's finish up with Doug with the screening process. What is any fitness for duty, duty drug test or background check or otherwise screening that you do? The uh, background check, definitely because we're in healthcare and you're dealing with patient information. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other piece too is I'm not a great fan of uh, I see in writing. I mean, I may like you and everything too, and you may say that you've been a coder or a builder for 20 years, but my contract with our hospitals, our organizations, I'm contracted to be 99, 98% accurate. And if you lie and you come into the system and you are don't know what you're doing, 
you're going to jeopardize everyone's job in my contract. So I'm not about to do that. So we have something in addition to a background check. Jennifer may be a coder for 20 years, but guess what? She's going to, we have an entrance exam. She is going to take a medical coder biller entrance exam, and she has to meet at least 80 points, 80%. If they do that, then they're eligible for hire and we move forward. We implemented that about five years ago because people don't always, you know, they, they don't want to tell the truth. So we have to protect our company and we have to protect, protect everyone else's job. So we started that and it works very well. But that's what we do as far as screening processes, just yes, a background check. And then, yes, you're going to take an entry to them. Mm -hmm. That's great. And I think it's very crucial how you said that this is uh, not only just protecting your company, but it's also protecting the patients, you know, at the end of the day. Yeah. So it's very important to um, for these employers. And as again, for job seekers, you can see they have very specific, like in this case, Doug has a very specific type of credentialing, which WAPA may not do, but price mark, but you know, buyer may not. So that's why you have to pay attention to who does what kind of screening so that you one are listening and two that you're following through. And I think as someone had said, if you don't follow up properly, then that's considered falsification or lying, okay? We wanna avoid all of these. And again, that's why I'm very explicit with these employers to talk about their screening process so that you yourself know what is expected and what you need to do to be able to follow those screening process, okay? So now let's get to career ladders. And this is something, again, uh, again, I'll speak for the folks that I serve people with disabilities, many times get into dead end jobs. And I, and I think we can say this again, you know, uh, across the board, but particularly for people with disabilities, we always want to see career moves, career opportunities, career ladders. And so this goes out to everyone now in terms of paying attention to what is a promotional rate internally. When you have an organization that promotes over half, I've known some that um, uh, promote 80% of the internal promotions. That's amazing. That means they really invest in their people. So listen to how their career ladders are and see if that's something that you could see yourself going up that ladder, okay? So let's start with Tracy. And I know this could might be a little hard because there's multiple positions or multiple sectors that you have, but in general, what are some of your career ladders or promotional internal opportunities? Well, in terms of promotions, we believe that our employees should get first consideration um, You know, when it comes to our vacancies. We conduct our recruitment process internally first, um, just to give everyone a fair opportunity um, to apply and possibly be selected for a job. Um, we have created career ladders for several positions, um, specifically um, our lineman apprentice um, roles. Uh, you can come in as a lineman apprentice or start as a lineman apprentice one, and we've created steps where you would then be promoted to an apprentice two, and apprentice three. Um, we've done the same with our administrative assistant uh, positions. You can move from an admin one all the way up to an executive assistant. Um, so we wanna make sure that employees have somewhere to go or something to strive for. Um, if we're not able to fill our positions internally, uh, which is at, at the important you know, factor for us, we, we, we're focused on using our internal talent, if that can't happen, then of course we take recruitment outside of the authority, but it's, just, it's the same thing. When you come into WAPA, you do have opportunities to move forward. Even if it's not in that role, mm -hmm. um, there, there are other opportunities where you will receive first consideration for a promotion or to move on something that best fits your skill set. Okay. That's great, that's great. And I hope everybody's listening to say, Tracy was very explicit to say, we look first inside, okay? You want to work for an organization that does that. It's so crucially important because you want to have a career and jumping around to other jobs won't give you that career. But if an organization like WAPA can let you jump around within the organization because you, you fit a certain job or skill set, then what a great opportunity for both of you to benefit. You get to have a career ladder and WAPA gets to have a loyal employee for, long, for longer term, okay? Okay, mm -hmm. Vaya, you next. How about in terms of career ladders and promotions? Um, just like Tracy, our preference is, of course, to begin in the company because you already, a lot of the things that we're talking about are how do you get in? These are people who have been working, they're already in, already engaged, probably received training. Uh, so we always start and we post internally first, and then several days later, then we will uh, post externally. So as I mentioned, we have the union track, and in terms of promotion, that's 
per our collective bargaining agreement. So you can start at the warehouse, move to IR, technician. So that path is pretty specific. And the movement is going to depend on a number of factors. As people retire, people leave the company, then things start to shift. That's on the union side. On the non-union side, um, and you often see people leave the union to go to a non-union management function. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility there. Um, and you know, I have so many great examples of people who came in doing one thing and they did, as I said before, learn more than just what's in your job description. I'll use an example of a recent promotion. Uh, and we have had quite a few uh, promotions within the last couple of years as the organization has been reshaped. And then we've also had an opportunity, our business solutions arm of the company has grown uh, really tremendously over the last few years as we've really taken a look at our government and business sectors and being that solutions provider. It's a very, it's a different type of job. And so we have had situations where someone who started off uh, as a customer service rep, she became a customer service supervisor. Within the last year, she shifted to a newly created marketing coordinator position. What was ideal about that was she, as a customer service supervisor, familiar with all of the products and services and who better to market really. She had the marketing background. And so, you know, as, as we're adding new positions, as we're reshaping the company, we look internally where if you, you may be one place doing something, doing it really, really well. And we see that uh, that would be a, a very smooth, natural transition. And it's worked out beautifully because she, she shifted to this new position, but she already came with 20 years of knowledge about the products and services. Mm -hmm. And she had a very good idea. And with the value background with her other credentials of how to market. But we, we have so many uh, examples like that. Um, so we're always excited about promoting from within. But I will say something about uh, movement. Um, and this is very important because we have right now, there's some open positions that we have contractor. It's a contractor position. So you may think while and I think contractor positions are always the best way to get in. Here's why. You come in, it's generally for a specific project, which means you really are immersed in learning something in a way that if you just had another job, you would probably, you know, so it's, it's very intense. Like we have a project going on right now for our TV plus conversion. So the, the contractors that are coming in, they're gonna learn a lot about cable TV and the platform that we were on and what we're moving to. So it's really intense, but more importantly, we have had so many people with a company that started as a contractor, they were dynamic. And when that project was over, we said, mm -hmm. You know what? You are really good. Let's find a role for you within the organization. And I've seen that happen quite a bit. We have, a, a, there's someone who's now a supervisor in um, our customer experience center. She started off as a contractor, then she became a cashier. Now she's a supervisor. So a lot of it has to do, there's the job description and your capabilities there. But if you come in and really show that interest um, beyond just what's in that official job description, I think you have a tremendous opportunity uh, to, to be able to, to move forward. And I think you said something very golden in the sense of for the employee, and in this case, job seekers, motivation is highly valued, highly valued. So when you're at an interview, you, you know, I, I talk to people and they say, well, I don't know why I didn't get the job. Like I'm personally a very enthusiastic person. I try to tell them you have to have some enthusiasm. You have to show them you're engaging. That shows motivation. And so I think to your point, Jennifer, here's someone who's doing it for 20 years, but because she was motivated, because she was creative, it sounds like something even came you know, you kind of almost created something because of that talent or those opportunities that were a good match for the business and a good match for her. So this just shows how important your personality is, you know, to be that one that's engaging and especially at the interview, it all starts at the interview to show your personality. And one of them most important traits is absolutely being motivated and enthusiastic, okay? Okay, so Marie, next, in terms of career ladders for you guys at Pricemark. Well, first, we, in, we advertise internally, but it has a lot of other, other aspects to, that um, can get you promoted. Your willingness, your dedication. Um, also, if you do an extra course, you let us know that you I did X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of times we try to um, get people internally, but because they didn't they don't have the particular um, qualifications, we cannot promote them. Like Excel is an example. We need certain people with Excel skills. Then if you have that, then it gives you a little boost. 
um, you also have to try to like if you go above and beyond you will be looked at first as opposed to somebody else the not only internally in St. Thomas that we have positions, we also have positions. We're in 13 countries right now. We also have the central office in Miami and the headquarters is in San Diego, California. So there are also positions open there also. So we have an internal website that they go on and they can see what positions are available in central in um, Miami and San Diego, you could apply for the different positions. They have had people who moved from Barbados to Jamaica to work. So is you're not only stuck in St. Thomas. So all of those things can get you promoted. Mm -hmm. But I, I think as, as Marie was saying about, you know, being able to move around, there are people who do want to move off island. I mean, our goal is to keep talent here. But, you know, every now and then someone does want, and why not have a talented VI person in San Diego or somewhere? So that does, if that affords a promotional opportunity, say that job is there opposed to here, then you can see why some people would look to work at a place like Price Smart or a franchise place so they, they could move around if, if they wanted to. So that's a good point in terms of, you know, additional potential promotional opportunities to soar. Okay, and Doug, in terms of any types of career ladders, and some of it might just be, uh, some of the certifications, but just speak to that and in terms of promotions. Okay. I've not always been a CEO. I've been the person at the bottom of the ladder, wishing that there was a ladder. And now that I am, and I've been a leader for a long time, I take very seriously the fact that part of my job is to build ladders and to look for people that want to climb those ladders. And um, when I look for people, I look for attitude, appearance, and behavior, those three things. I'll say that all the time when I'm working with them, <clears throat> the right attitude, the right appearance, the right behavior. And uh, part of those behaviors are is that they do the work. They get the certifications, you know. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the attitude, you know, when you see someone like Jennifer, my goodness, you just want to adopt her, you know. I mean, you got to have these, and, and we, we're infectious, and you want to work around those people. And um, you just continue on. So I look at those things, and then I apply them to what if I'm that person. I want that ladder. So I build those ladders. And then an example of one of these ladders in healthcare that we're building here in the U.S. Virgin Islands, you can start out just with a builder certification. And then the thing about it is, is right after that, you can apply that and transfer over and you can become an outpatient coder. The big demand for that. Then there's the inpatient coder. And the next thing is an auditor. You know, an auditor is like $75,000, $80,000. And then there's CDI, clinical documentation improvement. There's a ladder to climb. And along that way, when we see people that are showing up early, staying late, getting the job done, and have the right attitude, when we have management positions, we pull from that pool of people that we know and that we trust and we like to work with. They're pleasant to work with. Uh, and that's a part of our management team, and that's how we grow. So our career ladders, uh, it's, it's, it's twofold. It's, it's up to me to build the ladder. It's up to you how far you go. So that's our structure. How far you go is completely up to you. Mm -hmm. Well, these sound so amazing. I mean, I'm just impressed with every single one of you guys in terms of internal promotions. It seems to be definitely the, the overwhelming theme. Things have changed. I've been doing these roundtables for about five years, and I, this is the most I've seen that, that employers are really investing in their people, believing in their people, growing their people. And this is just great to see and hear because, again, as a job seeker, you know now these are not dead-end jobs whatsoever. And we may be talking the service industry, the IT, the utilities. Um, it, it doesn't matter what, what the employer is or what type of employer. Again, remote to, to traditional, you see there are promotional opportunities. There's great opportunities for career ladders, and they look inside first. So, again, these are all employers. This is why we call them choice employers. Choice employers are the ones who take care of their employees and look to internally promote them first. Okay? One of the reasons why they're choice employers. Um, on that vein, if we can, because we do have a little bit of time, I want to just ask another question that's not on the sheet, but if you guys could just speak to maybe some of the benefits um, that you get if you do work with you guys in terms of like health and things like that or retirement. Is that something you guys feel comfortable with? Maybe just talking briefly on some of the benefits. Okay, maybe if um, Tracy would like to go first. Sure. Uh, we offer a full benefit um, plan that includes uh, medical, dental, vision options. Um, we have a few tiers available based on the amount that you want to um, pay into each of our plans. 
Um, we participate in the GERS plan. So our employees are required to pay into that plan. Um, we offer EAP assistance um, and it's, it's um, a pretty comprehensive plan um, and we offer assistance and with, with different options with built into the plan. Um, we also participate in external vendors and offering MASA and AFLAC and those types of um, benefits. So it, it, it's pretty basic, but what's most important is that it's very affordable and that there are several options um, that best meets um, our employees' financial standing. Mm -hmm. Great, very good, very good. How about you, Jennifer? So we also offer healthcare, our, our provider is Digna. Um, so healthcare insurance, um, we, EAP, I think has been very, very critical, which is employee assistance program, mm -hmm. particularly um, after the hurricanes and the pandemic where a lot of people were really challenged. Yeah. Um, so that has been very, very helpful. Um, in addition to that, we are very proactive in terms of ensuring that our employees stay healthy. So we have health fairs. I mean, there are a series of things that we do uh, to be very proactive. And regarding another benefit that's important, um, particularly as you're a job seeker and perhaps you have, uh, you're interested, perhaps you have a high school diploma, but you're interested in moving forward. We also have a tuition reimbursement program uh, that many people take advantage of, uh, primarily at UVI, but also online courses. So uh, there's a lot that we offer internally in terms of uh, total care for the employee, and we have a 401k uh, pension plan. Great, sounds good. How about you, Marie? Do you have a, is there some things you can speak to the benefits? Yes, we do have um, certain benefits like life insurance, um, and it's free. We actually provide that to the, we also do the um, employer assistance program for not only for the employees, but for them and their family also. There's a performance bonus that we give out every year to the employees. And um, the 401k, the company matches up to 6%. If you choose not to um, participate, we, we do 4%. If you choose to 1% or more, then you get the additional 2% that the company actually gives you. And then you can contribute also. We also provide training, online training in-house. And also through LinkedIn, we do, we do have a degree program that we provide to more. Um, right now is only supervisors and managers. And we also have the health um, insurance, which is medical, dental, and vision. But that one is only for full-timers mm, okay. right now. Okay. And I can't remember the others off my head. Okay, no, that's great. Just to give, just give a little window. So thank you so much. Hey, Doug. You know, we have a number of programs. Uh, we have some people that their spouse has insurance, and they want to have the option to be a 1099 contractor, and they can make a little more. Um, so we get what's flexible. It's basically they can tell us what they're needing, and we'll kind of cater to those things. But a lot of the same. The biggest benefit that I see from what we're doing with the remote workforce is the freedom of your time and location. You can choose when you work and where you work. Um, I know it sounds funny, but you can work from the beach. You can work and travel. You can spend time with family. You know, if you're taking care of mom and dad or whatever sick child, you get to do that. You do not have to, you can, you can work remotely. It's a lot of freedom. It's a lot of power. It just changes the different lifestyle. But that, to me, that's one of the biggest benefits to, yeah. to what we're doing in healthcare, any of the jobs we're look, look, looking at right now. And technology has made this possible for anybody in the Virgin Islands. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, one thing I wanted to point out before I, we go to our second to last question is that when we were talking about internal promotions and different types of training, we call that now, they call it upscaling. And if, and again, if labor is on, feel free to chime in. With upscaling, there's opportunities at labor and, and, and vocational rehab as well, if you're a person with a disability has an employment barrier, to be able to get some trainings that will upscale you. So if it's customer service, you could take the next level customer service. If you want to be a supervisor, there's a training on that. So again, be cognizant, be aware that, that as you're looking for a job, you could be working with labor to upscale yourself right now as we speak so that you can be even a better candidate and have one foot ahead of other candidates on paper. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, 
So I want to ask, um, second to last question, I do apologize for kind of popping this question, but we're getting close to July, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act month. And it's something that is celebrated nationally, certainly, but wanted to bring it up now in terms of reasonable accommodation and just in terms of how you address that in your workplace. If that's something you can't answer right now, don't worry. I don't, you know, I'm just kind of put you guys on the spot, but if you can answer to that, uh, you know, some of the folks, again, we have online uh, may have disabilities. So if that's something you could speak to, and I'm just going to let whoever wants to jump in, jump in on this, because again, it is a pop-up question. If you have a disability, uh, vision sometimes is that it may be that disability. There's technology that will counter that and make it to where that you can work in the healthcare field. So if you, whatever disability you may have, dig into it a little bit, ask questions, reach out to the disability rights group here and, and see what's available. Don't sit back and just wonder, just ask those questions because with technology, it's amazing what can be done this day and age. And with the willingness of you know, employers like myself, you know, and Vaya and everyone on the call here, with our willingness and the technology, there's a lot of things we can change about your future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Definitely. And I'm glad you brought up the technology and low vision because some of the computers already have built in screen readers. And mm -hmm. so that's something, again, that might not even have a cost because it's already built in. <clears throat> if by chance, let's just say, using Doug's example, that there was a cost for a screen reader, then potentially it might make sense for the job seeker or the employee to talk to vocational rehab because if it helped maintain your job, then that is a good form of reasonable accommodation and they might be able to cost share that. So it's not just on the employer. So keep that in mind as a job seeker. If you think you might need accommodation, Doug is correct, give me a call. I've got other uh, advocates you can talk to to get second and third opinions. We've got a ton of resources on every kind of discipline accommodation. Have yourself be empowered first, know what you need, and then you'll be able to better advocate, yourself, advocate for yourself when you talk to these employers. And again, you may even have some leverage with voc vocational rehab to help cost share that so that you can get the most out of your work experience in the most accommodating way. Okay, just a little plug for VR. Okay, anybody else who wants to jump in on the disability? Okay, Tracy. Yes. Yes. Oh, go ahead. We do hire with disabilities all depends on the position because you can put somebody, we do have people who um, have hearing impaired. So it all depends on where they are at the time you can put them, but there are specific areas we can't like forklift drivers. I cannot put somebody who cannot hear on a forklift. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and that really speaks to um, essential functions of the job. That's why it's very important for job seekers to read a very detailed job description. Though it may not be every everything like Jennifer says, sometimes there's other things, but if you know generally that you can or can't do the essential functions, even with an accommodation, that may not be a good match because there may be absolutely no accommodations that could be put in place for a forklift driver. Therefore, that may not be possible. So just know yourself, know your disability, get information. That way you know if you're dealing with a situation where no matter what the accommodation is, there may just not, may not be one, but there may be one. So again, that's the point with, especially with safety. Sometimes uh, another example is medication, even though certain prescribed medications are allowed in the workplace, but if you're in a position of operating machinery, that may not be, uh, a, a, that may not be something that still can be had, even though you're a qualified person with a disability. So, okay, this gets very complicated. So if anybody has these issues, do feel free to call me and we will talk about it individually because again, this can get very complicated with medication and other things that can be related to reasonable accommodation. Okay, uh, Tracy. Yes, uh, we have a question on our employment application um, where we ask if you would require a reasonable accommodation for the position you're applying for. And it's really important for applicants to be honest and to actually answer that question because if we can identify whatever your need is from the beginning. Um, if, if we're taking you through the pre-employment process, it would be so much easier for us to make sure that you have what you need to be successful in your role from the onset. And I feel like a lot of applicants prefer to skip over that question or don't want to disclose that they do have a disability. And is really, of course, nothing to be ashamed of. It's you know answering that question truthfully really just helps you in the long run. And of course it helps us to, to make sure that you have what you need to do your best. 
I'm really glad you brought that up uh, in terms of what's on your application because there are certain questions that can be asked on an application. And Tracy said the, the, the one, the, really the only one that can be asked is, can you do the essential functions with or without accommodations? Some way, shape or form, if that's written, it cannot ask you if a disability, it cannot ask you if you take medication, it cannot ask you if you had a workers comp, it cannot ask you if you've been hospitalized. The only question they can ask is what Tracy said in that, in that form, okay? And this is where it's very important for you to know yourself. Again, as I just mentioned, can I do this job with or without accommodations? You need to know that. And let me answer also to, to Tracy's concern. This is, I, we see this all the time too, where people will skip over that question or they'll say no. Now, if you're a person with a disability and you don't need any accommodations, you don't have to check that box because you're not gonna need accommodations. If you're a person with a disability who, who knows they'll need accommodation, you have two options, okay? You can still say no, because in a sense, you're, you, you are still able to do the essential functions. When you get the job from day one, if you choose not to disclose right then and there, from day one, disclose. Do not wait, probation period, you may not make it through, okay? As Tracy said, her preference is you say it on the application. I understand why people don't because they see that as discriminatory and they're worried their application will go in the trash because now, they have, they have um, disclosed disability, okay? So I understand the concerns, but we certainly have to um, be um, forthright with the employer. And if you don't disclose it right then, disclose it your very, very first day. That is a duty that you should do, okay? If, if not sooner, okay? So that they're not knee deep in with you and then three, four, five months into it, um, there's problems or there could be um, termination or disciplinary because you didn't, you didn't say anything. And if you get terminated, and you then you want to talk about accommodations, it's too late. Getting your job back is not a form of reasonable accommodation. Okay. Okay. So I'm glad you brought that up, Tracy. Thank you. Um, anybody else want to jump in? Uh, Vaya, did you want to jump in? Uh, no, I think you covered all of the critical points in terms of, um, you know, making sure that the employer has good information to work with and be prepared to, to work with you. Um, not being truthful is not going to be helpful for anyone. Mm -hmm. And, and I hope that, you know, people are listening or seeing the sincerity of these employers. They want to know for good reasons. Okay? Exactly. We have to, in the disability community, we have to start moving that needle to say, I want to disclose because it's a benefit for me and for this job. Um, and, and, and again, we understand historically why people don't want to disclose, but saying what Tracy did, there's no shame. I mean, we can say that. We know there's still a lot of people who have discrimination, uh, discriminatory attitudes. But when you're an employer, you have to have zero tolerance. So therefore, these employers are being sincere to say, we want to help you because we don't discriminate and we have a process in place, okay? If you're unsure about accommodations, you call me. I would be more than happy to talk to you because now I can help you feel empowered when you do have these conversations with these employers, depending on the stage of uh, either application or if you're getting a job offer, okay? All right, thank you guys for jumping in with that. I really appreciate that. Let's let's end this, and then we're going to have time for Q&A. So I'm going to do another round robin. What is your best advice that you could give to a job seeker who's listening today in terms of joining your business? And we're going to mix it up a little and start with Marie first. First, do your research. Be truthful on the application. Fill out the application in its entirety. A lot of times you get an application and it's, there's no job history. Dress appropriately for the interview. Don't come with flip flops or short pants or just a sling and just say, I was on the road and I forgot. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a good one. I'm going to jump into what Marie said simply because this is how the round table came to be. I was working in upstate New York and I would go to these job fairs and people were just looking atrocious. Like you said, maybe not in upstate New York, we'd have flip flops in the winter, but we would have slippers. We would have um, jogging outfits. We would have hats and we would have babies. <laughs> so these are all things that just are not conducive to a job fair, okay? Um, so that's why I did these round tables where we brought the employers to the job seekers in their comfort zone. And this way, and if we were doing this in person, we would ask you to dress up. If you don't dress up and have business attire, then we know you're not taking this job search seriously. Okay, appearance does mean everything. I think almost everybody mentioned appearance. Okay, 
So that's why, again, this roundtable came to be so that we could have the employers come to the job seekers and the job seekers be prepared. Okay. So thank you, Marie, for that. That was a, that was a good ending. Um, how about you, Jennifer? Best advice you could give for someone wanting to work at VIA? And I will, I will uh, follow uh, Marie's statement about being prepared. Um, it's the little things in interviews. Recently, there was a person, and this actually ties into two of my key points, being prepared, but also being open to opportunities beyond even the job that you're seeking. So recently, we had a job fair, and uh, someone came in, and she was applying for a contractor position. Um, she had had other roles in other organizations at a higher level, but she saw the value of being a contractor, getting her foot in the door, number one. And as we were speaking to her, because here's the other thing, you're applying for the job, but you have no idea, you really don't have insight in terms of what's happening with the company. Because as we were speaking to her, the people who were speaking to her had additional information, including upcoming openings, you know, um, some changes that are coming. And so while we were uh, interviewing her, for this position, the way that she presented herself, we had her in mind for that position. She had no idea, she wouldn't. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, um, she came in and she was so prepared. We started talking about, uh, it's a community sales position. And we started speaking about it. And she interjected and said, I am familiar with the Affordable Connectivity program. She went through, she knew the program. She literally sounded like a commercial. She all, she sounded like she was already working for us. That's we great. were so impressed. So she's joined our team and she is amazing. Mm -hmm. And I can see that if she continues, the sky's the limit. And so, you know, when I talk about um, really seeing an opportunity, it's, this is real life. This is not something that happens once in a while. Uh, so when you're looking at the open positions, think about, unless it's something that obviously you have no interest in at all, but if VIA is a place that you're thinking, I would really like to work at VIA in these key positions, take a look and see what's available. And sometimes I, I can't say enough about those contractor positions. That really is the gateway to getting in and making an impression learning about the company. So when other things become available and things are always moving at VIA, you are uniquely positioned because they are, we already know who you are. You've already right. proven yourself. And so once again, we're gonna be able to promote someone internally into the next slot, but that's very, very important. Look at more than just the job that you're interested in at this point, if it's a place that you really would like to be then. And, and like I said, I have countless stories of people who came in as a warehouse attendant, um, and you know, within a year, they were an installer. All of these things, because we will train you. We will train you, but it's really uh, using the opportunity to, to at least get your foot in the door and, and move forward. So mm -hmm. that's what I would say to someone who's watching and, and interested in, in joining our team. I think it always goes back to the motivation, right? And I think as job seekers, you know, depending on what stage you are um, in your career, there's still something no matter what. If you wanna work, there is still something out there for you as long as you have motivation. And so I think that's what everybody's trying to get across in terms of good advice. Um, let's see, Doug, in terms of some um, good advice in terms of working for your organization. You gotta remember I'm a dad, okay? So I've got all kinds of advice for young folks and jobs. Bottom line, if you want to, you'll find a way. If you don't, you'll find an excuse. I don't accept excuses and nobody else will. Take ownership of your future right now. If you're listening to this, do your research and decide today that you want a better life and you're willing to pay the price, time, energy, education, whatever it takes to do it. It's up to you. It's not up to anybody else on the screen. They're not going to do it for you. And they don't want to work for people. They don't want to work with people that want to always have to hold their hand. Take control right now and decide you want a better life. You want to move forward. It's up to you. It's all in your head, but do it right now. And you've got all the help in the world here. And that's where I always go back to the attitude, the appearance, and the behavior. It's all within your control. And um, lastly, don't ever, for no reason, give up. If you want a position, don't stop fighting. Don't start preparing. Don't ever stop. Because in business, an example, two weeks ago, people have been contacting us about jobs. In one day, I signed three new contracts, and I had to hire a ton of medical coders. The day before, I didn't know that. Things are always changing in business. So you do not know how many jobs that 
that anyone's going to need. So don't what they have posted. It's always changing, like Jennifer said. Uh, and I am going to go and first reach out. I'm going to go first to those squeaky wheels, those people that are calling and reaching out and saying, I'm prepared and they're sharp. And I'm looking. Those are the people you want, the motivated people. So all this comes down to you. Look in the mirror, write it down, what you want, and do it every day. Don't stop. Don't take no excuses because you can climb the ladder. The jobs are here. Uh, it just comes back to you. So my advice is sweet, sweet and simple. As the dad person here, never give up and don't take no for an answer. Keep moving forward. So true. So true. And I think that can apply throughout your life, that attitude, for mm -hmm. sure. I totally agree with that. Yeah. And Tracy, I think, did we get to you? I think you were the last one. Okay. Yes. Right. Best advice. Um, I, I spent countless hours going through resumes and reading resumes. Um, I, I always tell job seekers, do not apply for a job that you do not qualify for. I'm in HR. I don't have an accounting background. I don't have a finance background. Applying for a job in those areas for me would be pointless. So really stick to a job or a position that fits your skill set. Um, if you go outside of that, I, you know, you're, you're wasting your time and you're, you're also wasting um, the recruiter's time. So really just focus on something that you know you can do, not something you want to learn how to do or something that you think you can do because people say that, well, I don't have experience, but I think I, I can figure it out. Well, no, it doesn't, doesn't work that day that way. Also, um, first impression as with so many other things in life, it's so important. Clean up your resume. Make sure that you have an email address on your resume that you check regularly. You know, don't put the email address that you haven't looked at in six months. You know, if you're looking for a job, make sure your telephone number is working. Make sure you put on a voice recording so I can leave you a message. Yes. If I call you a few times and I can't get you, I'm not going to text you. I have like 50 other people applying for this job. So make yourself marketable, you know, make sure that we can reach you. So clean up your resume, make sure your contact information is up to date. And as Marie mentioned, be prepared for this, the interview or the job, do your research. You know, if someone asks you, why did you apply for this job? You should be able to say why. Right. I mean, obviously we know you want to work. That's obvious. What do you know about our company? What do you know about this position? You really have to be prepared to answer those hard questions, but obvious questions that as, that as a recruiter, we expect you to be able to clearly articulate. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And one thing, a piece of advice in terms of doing your homework, go online and research the company. I remember one time I was working with someone and it kind of, it kind of resonates with what Jennifer was saying. As she said, I saw myself in the mission of your organization. Could you imagine an, a job seeker coming in and saying, I already see myself in that mission? That's someone who really took the time to understand. you know. And that's, again, why I asked the first question, what's the history? What's the fit? If job seekers are listening, they're saying, OK, this is a situation I see myself as a good fit. Or maybe not. And that's good, too. It's good to know both ways. OK, because like Tracy was saying, it's a waste of time if you don't have the skills and the fit. It's a waste of time for you, and it's a waste of time for them. I think you guys read resumes, well, like 14 seconds. 20 seconds, okay? They're looking for buzzwords. They're looking for certain things that are in the application. That's another piece of advice. When, when Tracy says, clean up your resume, first of all, have Department of Labor, work with them. They will be happy to give you extra critique and, and updates, okay? They have resume workshops. If you're a person with disability and maybe you have gaps, come see me in addition to Department of Labor. I can help you to work through those gaps so we can clean up your resume um, because the resume is the face of you until they see the face of you. And so make sure that is clean up and Tracy, that was great advice to do that, okay? Um, so we've come to the end in terms of the form formal presentation. Um, and what I'd like to do now, I see there's a couple of uh, comments in the Q&A, Tracy, or I'm sorry, <laughs> Nadia or uh, Kishma, are there any questions that are related in the chat box? Um, yes, there are, we have two. And okay. the first one is for the employers. Um, the question is, for the employers, do you offer paid training? Mm. Okay, so whoever wants, we can just jump in. 
Uh, right now, our company is an approved uh, training provider uh, through the Department of Labor. And uh, if you qualify, that training is funded through the Department of Labor. So yes, we could help to fund that if you qualify. Okay, I'm not sure if the question, Kishma, was do you get paid during the training? Is that the question? Um, or is the training paid for? Or whoever asked, feel free to unmute yourself or if we can to ask the question. No, the question was questions. for employers, do you offer paid training? Um, I can, and there was a follow-up question, not a follow-up, but another question for Doug. What benefits okay. does your company offer to prospective employees? All right. Uh, we offer similar programs as far as for healthcare, uh, life insurance, a limited life insurance policy, but you do get uh, some healthcare coverage as well. We, we don't offer external and um, paid external training, for example, if you go outside, but if we're doing training in-house, yes, we do offer, we do pay, and we, we actually tell you which programs that, but if you're interested in doing something externally, then we don't pay for it, at, at least at the moment. And again, it would be good to double check, as Marie saying, if it's external, double check with labor to see if they provide that training because our resources, to help with that. So double check that before you consider paying for a training. Okay, always, always check with Department of Labor and the workforce, okay? Well, I know a couple of employees who actually, I have actually told them to go to the Labor Department and they did do the trainings there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly, great, great, good to hear. Okay, anyone else on paid training? I, I know, uh, yeah, go, go ahead, Tracy. Oh, uh, we also don't offer payment for external training, but of course, when you come on board to work for the authority, um, we do train you during your six month probationary period and you are paid your regular wages um, during that, that time frame. Mm -hmm. uh, similar situation at VIA. So you are trained. So when you start, we will train you. And as I mentioned, we have certifications, national certifications that are now requirements for our team. Um, regarding external training, um, we will pay if it's something that we are prescribing. So uh, there's certain types of training uh, that the entire team will be taking. So we will pay for that. Um, but it, it, it depends on, it, it has to be, it's very specific about the type of training. Got you, mm -hmm. makes sense. Oh, well, one, one thing I wanted to mention as we talk about training, I think we've been focused more on um, technical customer care, those kinds of things. We are very, very engaged and involved and it's important for us um, we have, it's offered to all employees, it's not mandatory, but uh, Red Cross Disaster Preparedness Training. We do that on an annual basis. Preparedness is very important for us for obvious reasons. And uh, so it's, while it's not mandatory training, it's, we recommend it. And our employees, we are part of the ATN International Family of Companies, and there is mandatory training uh, for like CPNI, which has to do with company records, um, and depending on your role in the organization, there's other type of mandatory, uh, primarily online training um, that, that we do mm -hmm. beyond just the technical training. Mm -hmm. And let me add to all of this in terms of training as I keep bringing like, again um, up Department of Labor. There's also other incentives that are available to you as a job seeker through labor and also through vocational rehab. So things like OJTs, I brought that up, on the job training. So in terms of, of the employers here, if you just wanna raise your hand, who does OJTs with Department of Labor on the job training? If you wanna just raise your little reaction hand or your real hand is fine too. Okay, so VIA does OJT, does WAPA? Um, I don't believe we've, we've participated in that program with um, DOL. Okay, it could be because you're a government entity probably. How about you, Marie, do you guys do OJTs? No, we don't right now. Okay, and Doug? We're in the early stages of uh, moving forward with an apprenticeship program, which is through the Department of Labor. As I understand it, we're still learning the whole process. So our goal is to have it where we can have an apprenticeship program, which is connected to a uh, OJT type program. So the answer would be yes in the near future. 
Okay, wonderful. And what will that um, what will that be? Would that be the medical billing or a different part of your business? That would be for the medical coding and billing. Yes, is what we're it's our objective. Okay, great. All right, wonderful. Um, Kishma, any other questions? I see some more more um, comments. Um, yes, um, there is one. For Doug, um, what benefits does your company offer to prospective employees? Did I already ask that one? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's okay. I think I okay. did. Okay. And there's also one about do the employers hire persons who are just coming out of high school? Okay. Anybody In the healthcare world, uh, it has to be at least 18. And uh, this is something we're wanting to promote with the Department of Education to where possibly if it all works out to where they can be introduced to this field, junior, senior, and then by the time they take their classes, when they get out of school, they've actually got certification and they can enter the workforce. Wow, that's great. Wow. Yes, um, WAPA, we are definitely interested in hiring individuals out of high school. We have seasoned WAPA employees who have been with us forever, right out of high school, and they are now in leadership roles at WAPA. Um, our entry-level positions, you have to be at least 18 years old. You come on, we train you. We want to create career jobs for individuals. And, and yeah, we, we want to be able to catch individuals right when they're getting ready to enter the workforce to really create a situation where they have a career and can grow in that career instead of just offering them a job. So yes, we do hire individuals right out of high school. Uh, same thing at VIA. Um, we have many, it's not unusual in this organization to run into someone who's pretty young who will say, I've, I'll use myself, I've been here for 24 years and I'm not ready to retire. Um, I didn't start at high school, but we do have a lot of people that started. Uh, we work very closely with laborers, so starting maybe as a summer program. Uh, once again, going back to those entry-level positions, um, we have someone in finance, and I'm using some examples because I can think off the top of my head of real life examples of everything that I'm saying. Someone who came in in the lift program, the summer program, they were so amazing that it, he became a staple of the finance department. When the program was over, the CFO said, no, we're not letting you go. Mm -hmm. You were amazing for the summer. So once again, I really encourage everyone to think about that step in the door that you really can make such an impact that you are setting yourself up for success. A hundred percent. Yeah, I, Yes, we do hire people out straight out of high school. And even if they're below 18, we still do what we go through the labor department because it's a process you have to go through and the family, parents have to sign. So we, yes, we do. Mm -hmm. And right now, I believe, and again, if anybody's on with DOL, please feel free to chime in. I know right now, a lot of those programs, you mentioned the LIFT, the summer youth program. There's also one for 14 and 15 year olds. Uh, for career exploration, all those are in application stage and I believe are due April 21st. So um, again, just a quick round robin, who's participating with the summer youth program with labor? I think Jennifer, you said you are. Are you, as well, Tracy, you guys are too? Okay, and how about Price Smart? No. Okay, okay. So again, this just gives some people, maybe our school personnel that are on here work with transition age or high school students. So just keep that in mind that some of these employers do work with the summer youth program and to get um, that student's application in ASAP, uh, I think it's 16, uh, but I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's 16 and older, um, but there's a hard deadline and we're right in the midst of the application. So don't, don't miss that boat, okay? Kishma, is there another question in the chat? Uh, yes, and this one is for WAPA. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you apply for a job in the accounting department at WAPA if you reside outside of the Virgin Islands? Yes, you can. Um, we, our recruitment process is open to local candidates as well as stateside candidates. We, we're just looking for the right person for our vacancies. We are definitely open to individuals who want to move to the territory and work for the authority. Yes. 
So for you, WAPA, you have to, even though if you're a statesider, you have to relocate physically to work for you in the Virgin Islands, in this case, as an accountant. This right now, yes. Job. Right, not yeah, a right, job, it's not. Right, yeah, right now we, we don't have remote opportunities. So yes, you would have to relocate to the territory um, to work for pretty much any of our, our vacancies. Okay, good, just wanted to clarify that. Uh, to add on to the youth, uh, the youth point that you made a few minutes ago, uh, we're not currently working with the youth program, but we would like to. So if there's anybody on the call that could connect us or facilitate that, we're open to doing that. We just haven't started down that path yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good to know, Doug. Good to know. And just to give an example with Doug, um, as he mentioned, you can, if you're motivated, you can get up to that $70,000. It might take you a couple of years, but I know people in college who had four years, they don't make 70,000. So that's, you know, imagine doing a little bit of this in high school. And by the time you're 20, 21, you're making $60,000. That's pretty good. I mean, that's, so just think of it like that. Think of it in a, a long-term in the biggest picture you can. And I wanted to use Doug as an example. Um, Kishma, any more questions? I think I am in mute. I'm sorry. There's no, one no, more please. I see here. What opportunities do you see for older employees, like in their 50s, persons in their 50s? And that was a general question. I replied back to that, that the older I get, the, the younger 50 gets. I mean, so it's not that 50 is not that old. Okay, first off, okay. Uh, we have people that have started our program uh, at age 60. Uh, they looked at a uh, changing things. They wanted to change their careers and they wanted to work part-time once they completed the program. Well, they can do that working remotely. They have a lot of flexibility. So there's opportunities working remotely at a, virtually any age. Mm -hmm. um, we, we do not discriminate. So as long as you're physically able to do the job, yeah, we, we do hire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same answer. We, we, we don't discriminate. Um, we are just looking for the right person to fill our vacancies. Uh, same thing at VIA. And as we are expanding our sales team and doing more community sales, um, we find that for many people, and I, I agree with Doug, 50 is not senior. So I'll just put that out there. <laughs> I feel attacked, <laughs> but um, the, the um, and then there's certain roles going back to some of the contractor positions where, where that's ideal for someone who's, who is still interested in working, but they don't want to do the eight to five. They want to have that flexibility, but they still want to continue to work. So absolutely there right now, there are actually amazing opportunities uh, for people who are over 50 because we are expanding what our sales team and even what it means to be a part of that looks like, which includes contractor and part-time positions. So absolutely. And, and I'm glad that Marie started the conversation about not discriminating because of age. There is a law on the books for age discrimination and that's 40 years and older, which really sounds like a spring chicken. <laughs> We're talking 50, right? So that's what the threshold is for the feds to say age discrimination that's 40 years and older. Okay, so just as an FYI. Um, any other questions? Um, no, not at this time. Okay. So I wanna give the um, panelists, each one of you, just some closing remarks as we close this up and just appreciate your time. I know 90 minutes is, is a fair amount of time. So we just appreciate your time, all the great information. I hope your job seekers have been listening. I hope you've been um, paying attention about their process. So I just wanna do one last round Robin to any kind of contact information or whatever you think is helpful for them to get started with their job search in terms of practical things like, again, websites, phone numbers, whatever it may be. So um, Tracy, I'll start with you at WAPA. Oh, you're on mute. I'm sorry, Ms. Carr, can you repeat that please? I'm sorry. Sure, sure. I was just saying, as we close this up, I just wanted to have each one of you have any closing remarks and include any contact information that job seekers should have. Okay, sure. Um, really, again, I, I believe WAPA is really um, 
an employer of choice in the territory. Um, we, we have hardworking employees. Um, we're an important um, part of, of the daily lives of, of individuals in the territory, um, business owners. And we are seeking individuals who are not shying away from hard work, but really looking for meaningful work and looking for career opportunities, not just job opportunities. So I, I'm not directly involved in recruitment as much as I used to be. I'm more on the employee development and training side. Um, but I am, um, of course, willing to share my contact information. Um, it's Tracy Wells, I'm sorry, Tracy.Wells at viwapa.vi. I still work closely with our recruiter. Her name is Monet Lewis. She is our new talent acquisition specialist. And that's Monet, M-O-N-E-T dot Lewis at V-I-W-A-P-A dot V-I. Also, we have an online application system that we launched back in 2019, where you can go online, look at all of our vacancies, apply online, submit a resume, submit your certifications and any supporting documentations to really show that you're the best hire for whatever position you're interested in. Um, you can visit our website, www.viwapa.vi, click on Discover WAPA, and then click on Career Opportunities, and then you'll be able to view our full listing of vacancies. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And again, I hope your job seekers are paying close attention, taking that information, and following the instructions, okay? Okay, how about you, Marie? Just some last parting words and some contact information or, or online application. At the moment, we do not have an online site. However, you can pick up an application at the membership desk. And contrary to what most people think, when before I came on board, I was like, I never wanted to work in the supermarket. But then after working there, I realized there were lots more positions than people th actually think. It's not just cashier. You actually could be an inventory auditor. I worked in many different positions in PriceMart before. Mm -hmm. Membership um, supervisor. You could also not only be a stalker, you could become a supervisor. So there are many different positions. So you could just open your mind. And once you're a hard, dedicated worker, there will always be upward movement. Because my club manager right now, he actually started off as just an inventory auditor and a stalker. So we have those who start as stalkers and they're actually in high positions right now. Great. Okay, so the, here's an employee who's a little old school, but stop by Price Mart again, just just for St. Thomas, um, and they've got hard applications at the membership desk. And Vaya. So um, first of all, thank you again for having me here. What mm -hmm. I'd like to say in terms of parting words, so Vaya is a place I think a lot of times because we are a solutions provider, uh, people think about customer service and technical positions, but really any type of background in any possible career is at VIA. And I think it's reflected even in the open position. And I'll just list very quickly positions that we have open currently. We're currently looking for a community sales contractor. That's a position that I've been talking about. Uh, we're looking for a network technician, an HR and general office administrator. We're looking for a marketing manager. We're looking for a consumer sales supervisor and a business account manager. So just in our open positions, we're covering sales, marketing, technical positions and HR functions. So really there is something for everyone at VIA. We have 180 plus employees. And as I said, it's a, it's a place, of, place of growth. It's very, very dynamic um, in order to move forward. And I would say, if you're looking, always pay attention as Tracy mentioned, going to the sites to see, because you know I can leave this meeting and maybe in the last two hours, a decision was made to maybe put two more positions out. Things are constantly changing. Uh, so our website is via.vi and look under the careers tab. You start the process online. So um, we do have the online portal. So you start the process and then you're prompted uh, to move forward. But just always see what's available, see what's open. Um, it's, a, it's a great place to work. Like I said, I've been here for 24 years and I've just had a chance to see the company really grow. As Tracy talked about, you know, we're really interested in people who are coming in and serious about having a career because you can have a great career in technology in the USVI. You can have, uh, you know, a lucrative position. When I look at our, management team, um, you know, our statistics are amazing. You know, our, ma our management team, primarily local people, 
um, women in terms of diversity. 40% of our managers are female, which is something we're very, very proud of being in the technology space. And so, you know, when we look around, it looks like us. It looks like the VI and all types of backgrounds. Uh, mm -hmm. Some high school graduates who have learned, uh, other people with other credentials. So you really see, you know, we reflect uh, the USBI, but always check our website, via.bi and look for the careers tab uh, to see what's happening at VIA today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and since we, you know, we seem to have some young people on, just out of curiosity, if someone starts out of high school, when could they retire technically with you guys? Just out of curiosity. How many years do they have to work? <laughs> um, so that's an interesting question. I mean, you know, th there are a number of ages that are, are thrown around in terms of retirement, and there's a formula in terms of retirement. Um, but if you come out of high school, I mean, it, it's not unusual at all. Uh, most people, uh, when they're retiring, they've been here for 30 plus years. Um, that's not at all unusual. We had two gentlemen last year who retired after being here for 52 years. Uh, and these oh were people God. who literally started. And it's not, I mean, they were still young, relatively speaking, because they did start very early on. So you can have a very full career. And I think it speaks to the type of company we are. You mm -hmm. must like something about it to want to stay 50. That's just most of your life. Yes, you know, you absolutely. literally grew up in the company. They started families in the company, you know, so yes. that's a yes. testament. You know, people don't stick around for 50 years if the place is not someplace that they're happy to spend, you know, most of their life. So I think that says a lot. But our, in terms of retention, um, it, you know, our employees come and they stay. Uh, mm -hmm. Turnover is not very high um, in general. Uh, so, yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. And how about you, Wapa? Once... What's uh? What can someone retire if they start out of high school? Well, for our safety sensitive positions, you can ret re retire after twenty years of service. Okay. And Great. then non safety sensitive or non hazardous positions, you re retire at about thirty years. Okay. So if you're coming right out of high school, you can do the math, and that's pretty much what it would look like, um, in terms of your final or separating from the authority. I think a lot of people have this vision that you have to be 70 and, you mm -hmm. know, you have to no, no, you see clearly, you know, we're talking about 50 being older. You're talking about some people at 50 retiring. So yeah, it's yeah. really good to know. And I know with you, Marie, it really varies being that you're a customer service, you're a service provider. So, um, you know, I know that varies. We are, we are pressed on time. It is 102. I want to be respectful of everybody's time, especially our employers who have, who have graciously given you, uh, the job seekers, you, uh, their time to tell you about their openings and their screening process. Not sure if we lost Doug, but um, if Doug is on, um, I think somebody put his email in the chat and I certainly have his contact information. So just a big thank you to the employers. This will be recorded and will be put on our YouTube to share. Feel free to let your friends and anybody else know to check this out. We really uh, just appreciate you attending. Hope you had a good time. And thank you, Kishma and Nadia for the people with disability rights helping to facilitate this today. Everybody stay safe, stay well, and stay blessed. Okay, take care everyone and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.